Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Minding Our Monuments. I'm Rodney Dawson with the Greensboro History Museum. And once again, this is our webinar series that we started back on Tuesday, help me out, March 15th. And we had an episode on March 22nd. Uh, we took last week off and we're resuming tonight. Very excited to have our panel assembled here uh, for Minding Our Monuments, Discovering Lost Pieces of Greensboro History in Public Spaces. And um, uh, mention our education staff that's uh, come together to help make this happen, Kathy Rosick and Katherine Johns, and our outreach team, which includes Glenn Perkins, who's behind the scenes, and Sarah Mask for getting the word out, and our webinar volunteers, Joanna Foley out of Berkeley, California, Joni McMasters from the great North Carolina a and State University, Aggie Pride, and Bianca Cobb from right here in Greensboro, and that particular list of names helped make this webinar possible, so please continue to support so that we can continue to offer in this way. And also email me, I'll put my email in the chat, any ideas for future programming. I've received many wonderful ideas already and look forward to more. And I'm speaking about monuments and so please be aware of uh, forthcoming, uh, upcoming monuments that will, and markers that will be here in Greensboro honoring uh, folks like Gertrude Will, uh, or Gertrude Will, I'm sorry, with the women's suffrage mo movement, Lavania Curry, who was a, a free person of color and an abolitionist as well as women of the Shoah and the uh, monument that will go up uh, commemorating the women that were lost in the Holocaust. And for tonight, please feel free to post your questions uh, as we begin in the Q&A section. We will hold questions for the end or near the end. However, I will often uh, break ranks and get them in as we go along. Tonight, we're joined by descendants of Ishmael Titus who was formerly enslaved. And it was a practice by the British to offer freedom to enslave to exchange for service in the Revolutionary War, however, as in all major wars and conflicts in the United States, African-Americans fought primarily for a love of country and to show their commitment that was hoped to facilitate a better way of life uh, after their service. And this was also the case in the Revolutionary War. And it is noted that Ishmael Titus uh, fought valiantly during the Revolutionary War and was known as a Revolutionary War hero. And while history does not notate the service of black men during the war sufficiently, the contributions of black soldiers were significant and substantial. In the American Revolution, gaining freedom was the strongest motive for uh, Black enslaved people who joined the Patriot or British armies. It was estimated that 20,000 African Americans joined the British cause, which promised freedom to enslaved people and as Black loyalists. And around 9,000 African Americans became Black Patriots uh, fighting uh, on the side of America. And as between 200,000 to 250,000 soldiers and militia served the American cause during the Revolution, in total, that would mean those black soldiers made up approximately 4% of the Patriot numbers. But of the 9,000 black soldiers, 5,000 were combat dedicated troops. Notably, the average length of time in service for an African-American soldier during the war was four and a half years due to many serving for, many also who served for eight years in their duration, which was eight times longer than the average period of uh, white soldiers. Meaning that while they were only 4% of the manpower base, they comprised about 25% of the Patriots' strength in terms of man hours. And uh, this includes supportive roles as well. So in contrast, about 20,000 people escaped slavery, joined and fought for the British Army. Much of this number was seen uh, after Dunmore's proclamation and subsequently the uh, Phillipsburg proclamation issued by Sir Henry Clinton. And so though between only 800 to 2,000 people who were enslaved reached Dunmore himself, the publication of both proclamations provided incentive for nearly 100,000 enslaved people across the American colonies to escape, lured by the promise of freedom. And one such black soldier, and among the first to be killed in the Revolutionary War, was the black patriot Crispus Attucks, whom many of us may have heard of. He was shot uh, dead by British soldiers in the Boston Massacre in 1770 after he shouted, kill them, kill them, knock them over. And while the soldiers were being battered with shells and ice and coal by the mob armed with clubs, he considered, he's still to this day considered an iconic martyr of Patriots. So to learn more about it from a narrative standpoint or storytelling perspective, we thought of the good idea to go to one's family and descendants. And we we're fortunate to have three descendants of Ishmael Titus, Deidre Lavelle, Solomon Titus Taylor, and Sage Chioma joining us tonight from New York, Balt I believe Baltimore, I might be New York, New York and Greensboro, but uh, I'm thinking it might be New York, Baltimore and Greensboro. I'll clear that up. But the Titus family, thank you for honoring us with your time and uh, welcome to Mining Our Monuments, Discovering Lost Pieces of Greensboro History in Public Spaces. Sage Chioma, she's gonna lead us off. She's having some technical issues uh, this evening, but we are glad to have her 
audio feed. So Sage uh, Chioma, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. We really appreciate uh, the effort that you are putting in to deal with the disparities of monuments in regards to the contributions of African-American people in the country. I wanna thank Joanna who contacted me through mail after her article was published in the Greensboro News and Record. I live here in Greensboro and the other person, Solomon, who is our family historian, doesn't live in Baltimore. He is out of Rochester, New York. So I was a native New Yorker and Deidre also is a New Yorker, but I moved here. And Solomon, this is really his um, divine assignment. And he has gathered our family in more ways than one around this assignment that he um, was, I'd say, divinely given. And it's really an honor because I walk in the park, Guilford Courthouse Military Park, frequently. And to find out that uh, my descendant actually was a hero as a result of that particular battle was overwhelming to say the least. But Solomon kind of rallies us all and he started the journey because of his grandfather. And so the two, uh, Solomon and Deidre are the elders. I'm an elder in my family too, but they're the two elders that have really been on this journey the longest. And what Solomon shared with me is a tradition that's part native as well as most indigenous when in their natural um, way and traditions is that the elders usually raise the kids and the young, hard, healthy people do all the work and the grandparents teach the children about the mystery of life and their lineage. And his grandfather was that for him and then he went to the military and when he came back, the last 12 years of his grandfather's life, he just gave him a lot of names of his 12. And that was the clan that Solomon started with. And he worked his way backwards and he had a few mystical experiences along the way. That's a whole nother webinar. But Deidre and him are really the spokespersons for this. Um, so I'll just say Deidre Lavelle is a dancer, choreographer, actress, mother, director, mm -hmm. media producer, filmmaker, art and science researcher, a holistic wellness practitioner, and a globe trotter, gardener, chef, mentor, and photographer. She's into arts, health, and environmental activism. And I say that because one of the things that Solomon shared with me is his mission was about looking at what had become of all of us. And I think for me, it's really deep because I'm not a historian, but I tell the story of the civil rights movement a lot and I am into social justice. And so to think that the history is where all the evidence is that we all have made great contributions and sacrifices. Um, it's really important that these stories are told and it's kind of, sad that we have to patch it together even though we have the ancestry and all of those things. African-Americans still have to patch a lot of it together. And so I'm grateful that his grandfather's lived experience was where he first started this journey. And so Solomon um, Titus uh, is born in Rochester, New York and received his education in the Rochester City School District where he uh, was a two a uh, letter athlete in football and basketball. And uh, three days after his graduation, Solomon was standing on the yellow footprints of the United States Marine Corps boot camp, where he, will, uh, where he has served from 1979 to 1996, uh, with 16 half years of active duty service and seven years in the reserves. So I'm gonna say that Finding out that there was a war hero in the family, I guess he just couldn't help himself. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Solomon or Deidre at this point. Well, um, 
Sabra. So, so seems to be having some technical difficulties. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So thank you. Um, I am going to do a, a, a further introduction of Solomon um, because he is, as Sage so rightfully stated, the family historian whose mission has um, been for over 20 years. And whenever a person dedicates 20 years of their lives to opening doors, I, um, I think that there's, that the family have nothing to offer but gratitude and great love because there was a need for this information to be passed on. And most of our stories do come out of the front pages of our family Bibles, and they come out of uh, the stories being told around the kitchen table as the ladies prepare the food, and they come um, at the dinner table after church on Sunday, and they come on the porch after a good meal or after a thunderstorm. And um, these stories are the real history because our tradition of oral communication and sharing, passing the stories down through the oral tradition makes them genuine. And I divert for a moment because I want to, as a healthcare practitioner, tell everyone that organs are connected to extremities and the extremity connected to the heart is the tongue. The tongue is the tool that we use to communicate. So you can write anything down. You can change the script. You can do it now electronically and you can even get word substitution. But when you are speaking, it is speaking directly from the heart to the hearts of the listener. And this is how memories are stored. They are stored because they are passed on through a spiritual, through a spiritual chain that comes from our hearts. I'm so happy that we had elders from the past few generations who were willing to speak because our experience as, as African Americans has been so horrific in many cases in this country that population has been terrorized into not speaking. The women generally carry the stories and the men carry the skills. And when a woman loses her ability to speak, she cannot relay the history of the family. And without the history of the family, the skills that take us from one generation to the other are lost. So to bring it all in a full circle, our family had the ability to pass the ball to whoever would receive it. And this, in this particular instance, a male carries the story. And I'm so glad about it because he's a better storyteller than me. And I'm really, really so fortunate and so grateful to the creator for bringing Solomon into my life via Ancestry.com. That's not a plug. I just want you to know that they're not sponsoring this uh, event, but that's how we found each other. And we found each other th through correspondence that said, we have uh, similarities on our family tree and I'd like to connect with you. And so I thought, well, there's some man trying to pick me up on the internet. That's not gonna work. So I said, send me your picture. I'll tell you if we're kin or not. And he sent me the photograph and he's the doppelganger of my uncle Samuel, whose picture I might show in a little minute. But um, I said, oh yeah, he's one of ours. He's definitely one of ours. And as we met and began to share photographs, memories, stories, just as we began to share the realization of being able to have such a close connection with someone that you've never, ever, ever seen or met in your life. 
And of course, that all changed and my life changed and my family's life changed, my immediate family's life changed as a result of meeting Solomon. And as a result of meeting Solomon, I met Shoma, I met Sage Shoma and so many other family members, maybe 200, 250 people since I've met Solomon that are a part of our um, bloodline. So Solomon, I think you have to take it from here. I have um, a, a video that I'm going to share my screen and um, let play while you decide if you can get some sound. This is uh, how our journey began. <laughs> There's more, but you know, we could do this all night. So Solomon, please, the floor. Well, can everybody hear me? Show of hands. Um, I'm Solomon and I would first like to thank you for this invitation and the journey that we've been on has been tremendous. Thank you for joining this journey with us as a family. Um, we are the descendants of the tightest Africans here in America. And as stated, our bloodline has been on these lands before America was America. And when you learn of those from which you come from, and when you have been tagged as the one to gather the children, and tell the children the story for future generations, I would have never thought that almost 43 years after getting out of high school this year, I would be in this place at this time. And the reason I say is because as we go through this journey of life, we never know where it's gonna take us. But one thing I do know is that when you're touched by something special, when you've been given something special and you understand what that special is, you have no other choice but to move forward. And that's in anything that any of us do in our lives. The things that we do are what has been placed in us as a purpose on our lives for mankind. And it just so happens that my journey, as Sage stated, Three days after graduation from high school, I was standing on the military Marine Corps boot camp footprints. And that was for me, after so many years of thinking about it, a rite of passage in a, in, 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 in a sort of way. Um, because when you learn certain things and you look at how and where those whom we come from, going back to Africa, there was a point in time where the young men had to go through a rite of passage to become young men. And it just so happens that the dynamics of everything has changed. We still go through certain rites of passages. And when I embarked on this journey, again, based on information that my grandfather gave me during the time that he was living, um, I would have never thought that such a thing would happen. When you learn that you are a child of one of the most greatest African empires that ever 
dotted the face of the earth, that's life changing. And when you can touch in spirit what they went through in order for you to exist today, and then when you understand that the universal connection of a people has been awoken in yourself and those whom you know, as far as your bloodline is concerned, that's life changing. It's life changing. And it's been life changing for all of us. And when I say all life changing for all of us, and when I say all of us, when you learn that there was a set of twins or a twin set of boys born in 1700s, 1746 to be exact. And the tightest name and the tightest bloodline has been on these lands. And you learn that through that bloodline, going back and coming forward has been very unique in itself. I remember writing a story to some family members and the story was, I wish you can see what I have seen. I have seen so much in what was, so much in what is, and so much in what can be of a family is just mind blowing. And we will be here for months trying to figure it all out of where we go next. But the thing is, it's unique in itself. Ishmael Titus told his story in the court of law. He told his story in a way that it could not be misconstrued or anything because the history of itself keeps it alive. The history of what happened to Ishmael has been kept alive. The journey of Ishmael's Titus bloodline has been kept alive here in America. And now a time has arrived in our lives that it's, it's up to us to move forward and share his story with the world, share our story with the world, and then share our story as we educate the family, we educate the world. And that's just my position on it. I, again, thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to what the future brings to our family. But when you learn that a bloodline of five or 12 African boys born between 1810 and 1845, and Ishmael passed away right around 1850, 52, he was here when the bloodline that we learned that we come from was still here, was here on this earth while he was still here as well. And out of the 12 Titus boys born into slavery, we as a family, those that have gathered and joined myself on this journey, we have uncovered the locations and visited visitations with five of the 12 Titus boys that was born into slavery have been reunited in our Titus bloodline. And again, which has thrust us moving forward into reclaiming Ishmael as an American Revolutionary War hero and a war hero and a family man to our family here in America still alive. We are the children of the Fulani people, of the Fulani nation out of West Africa, Cameroon and Sierra Leone. The Fulani people are descendants of the Jalaf empire, which dates back to the 15th and 16th century at the fall of those kingdoms. But still yet that bloodline of the Titus Africans still living and breathing in us. And I'm gonna share with you all, a day will come where you will actually put your eyes on if not all of the Titus Africans here in America, but the majority of the Titus Africans found here in America. And I thank you all, thank you all. So I would like to just speak to how um, we all heard of Christmas Addicts and we all, I guess it's common knowledge now that he was not the only African, he was only black in the Revolutionary War. He was just the first to die is what was always said so poetically in the history that I read. 
I think when I found out or how Joanna found me is that I went to uh, the military park and I had car trouble and I wound up speaking to Viola who is a ranger there. And so- Sage, the, Sage you're talking about the um, National Military Park in Greensboro. National, right? Yeah, Guilford, Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. So when I got into, uh, had car trouble there, uh, she and I talked briefly, but she printed up the document that Solomon is referring to in regards to court papers. And so the story uh, from what the court papers tell is that he was a hero because the Guilford Courthouse battle uh, was where he actually was captured, but he was asked to go look for a horse and when he did, he came across patriots and brought them and showed them where other patriots were being held. And that way they were able to ambush. And although they did not win that particular battle, it is said that uh, Britain lost most of its men in the next battle, they couldn't go forward. And so that stands out for me because he's, not just, and as he said, twin boys, because he had a brother named Primus, who there is less written about, but they both served. And so the story behind Ish Ishmael is that he was in Mecklenburg, but it says he was born in Virginia. So when we look at the 1700s and we think about him being born in Virginia, that means like Virginia, where you know there were people there who were indentured and then became slaves. So we don't know how far back, because of course, you know, you were just considered property and I you wouldn't go through really counting. It would be counted like cattle or sheep or whatever other livestock, instead of having a story behind each person. But because Ishmael had that particular um, courthouse document, we know what he did. And so Mecklenburg, there was a journalist whose name I don't know. Do you know the journalist named Solomon who actually was the first to actually bring uh, Ishmael to the forefront because there is a plaque for him since he was enslaved in Mecklenburg County. And his, um, the plantation owner asked him to fight one year in place of him. And then he would actually give him his freedom. Yes, yeah. that that um, that beginning came from a historian by the name of Marty Mangello out of uh, Shelby, North Carolina. And Marty and I uncovered the Ishmael story um, almost simultaneously, and. Um, I'll I, I, I share a brief of it with you. Um, I had found the Ishmael story early in research, uh, looking for the Titus, looking for the Titus African, um, meaning that my, our great great grandfather, uh, Sage, um, Deirdre, all of our great great grandfathers, that of Glasgow Titus, uh, born in 1845. That's the that's the lineage of the Titus branch that we come from, the 1845 branch, which is which is the youngest branch of the Titus Africans. So when I went looking for the African of great, great grandpa, um, I had my grandfather, my great grandfather's name and Robert Titus, and I ended up in Massachusetts. And I found Titus's in Massachusetts in the slave records. And I also found other individuals in the Massachusetts area um, in the 1600s. Now, when I when I when I fell into the 1600s, it was almost startling because I'm gonna tell you, had had they not created certain things for us um, electronically, and we were still using uh, microfiche and all that type of stuff, none of us will be having this conversation right now because I didn't have the patience to do that. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I just didn't have the patience to do that to do that type of research. So they made it a little easier for us with the documents in the in the in the, the Library of Congress, the way they chronicalized everything. So it got a little easier, but to say that, to say this, um, Ishmael was also in Massachusetts area. 
And I found him, his brother Primus, and then there was another named Reuben in the slave records. And I learned that in the Massachusetts area, there was a huge Titus presence at one time. But when I learned that the huge Titus presence was not that of um, African-Americans, it was of Caucasian Tituses that had migrated also out of England into Massachusetts during the early 1700s. So that's the time when they were actually coming across colonizing. So I just assumed that Ishmael would have been a slave of those had, that had come across the Isles uh, during the colonization of this part of this, this, you know, this continent here. And so I set it on the shelf for a bit and I figured one of these days I'll go back and visit it because looking for someone in the 1700s, um, it would have been a huge task. So I figured I'd better stay close to the vest and stay within the 1800s and find those that I can actually physically uh, speak with. And out of that research is where I found the 12 Titus African boys born into slavery between 1810 and 1845. And then from there, I was able to find other family members. But in Ishmael's case, um, I received a message one day from a few cousins and said that you need to, Solomon, you need to take a look at this. And at first I thought they were playing, uh, playing games with me uh, because they know the seriousness of where I had been in the research of our, our, our Titus family. And they showed up at the house, three, of, three cousins showed up at the house one day and they said, Solomon, no, you really need to take a look at this. They found Ishmael. And I was like, how did someone find somebody that was born in the 1700s? No, no one found nobody and I don't wanna hear it. They said, no, Solomon, you really need to look at this. And they gave me a photo and a phone. One of my cousins had already made, uh, had, had done some research and got phone numbers. And that's when I called Shelby, North Carolina. And I spoke with Marty Mangello and his wife, Stormy Mangello. And I asked, and, I, and after the introductions, um, it was said that uh, he had been looking for Titus descendants and I wanted to know why he was looking for Titus descendants. And then we shared that we had been researching the same Ishmael Titus uh, for a short period of time. And then I made my way to Shelby, North Carolina to meet with him physically. And then we learned of what he had already done up to that point because uh, Ishmael Titus had fought alongside Marty Mangello's great great grandfather during the Revolutionary War. And when Ishmael, I mean, when Marty Mangello was uh, gathering his, his ancestors' story, he learned of Ishmael's story and felt that his story should have been told because African American stories, African Americans, uh, Africans that had fought during the Revolutionary War, their stories had not been uh, fully told. And this was one that he felt had been fully told, should be fully told. So he went on ahead and commissioned the painting and the, the artistry of what we seen earlier in Ishmael Titus. And Marty has been working uh, alongside myself and the family uh, ever since. And I was able to take a few family members about uh, 10 to 15 of us, a few, uh, actually last year, last uh, summer in July. Yeah, we went, it was, uh, we went to Kings Mountain because yes. uh, the three battles is Kings Mountain, Deep River, and Guilford County Courthouse. Yes. But I'd like to um, say Kings Mountain is really a mountain because we were walking, <laughs> we were like, you got us going all the way up this mountain. It was pretty incredible. And I was honored to meet uh, the historian because I had heard so much about him. So it was, uh, it became more real going to meet him. Mm -hmm. And that um, portrait is actually what the plaque in Charlotte is taken from. So the plaque in Charlotte looks just like that. That let, they- let, let, let me take a look here. here. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's me giving the feedback or not. But, uh, you know, I was going to say, Sage, that's what Marines do. They, they, they go the hard route. 
<laughs> take you up mountains and stuff. <laughs> you know, the smart guys join the army. I, I got to dig you on, <laughs> on the air here. Um, but you know, I want to ask you a couple questions. And, and speaking of questions, go ahead and put your question in, in the chat if you have one. There's a Q and A icon down at the bottom, uh, so you can type it in the chat or type it in the Q and A. But uh, Kings Mountain National Park is uh, is erected a marker to African American patriots in 2016. So if you make your way up there, check it out. Uh, but you told the story was commonplace, I believe. And I want to ask you about your grandfather who kept this narrative going. I put in the chat earlier about how in the African community, the Griots, who was the storyteller, um, kept the history going. And I, I talked to some folks in an exhibit that we had up recently, a display on the Aggie Eagle Classic between North Carolina Ante and North Carolina Central. And one of the uh, chief players or one of the more notable players, Alan Hooker, said, you know, it's important that we tell our kids and our kids and our grandkids about these games and about this history to pass it on. So it's important that the Titus family is doing what they're doing and more families should do that, particularly African-American families when your history is not not noted. But it, I believe it was commonplace or not commonplace, but it happened frequently uh, that uh, when you had an enslaved and a master, the master might uh, uh, make or request that the enslaved person fight in their stead. Here in uh, Guilford County, there was a gentleman by the name of William Kitchens who deserted. He was um, he owned uh, enslaved. He was a white gentleman, and he deserted. He was caught, and when he got caught, he was threatened with being sent back. So he offered up a, uh, his enslaved person, Ned Griffin, in his stead, and he said, "If Ned, if you fight, I'll give you your freedom when this is over." But in 1782, uh, when the when it was over, and Ned Griffin came back and he fought, uh, he uh, backed out of the deal. And so Ned in turn uh, brought, brought suit on him. He went to the he appeal to the North Carolina General Assembly and in, in 1784, he was granted his freedom. So uh, I believe that was something where you used the enslaved to substitute your service was something that happened uh, frequently during that time period. But uh, before I get too off track, tell us about your grandfather who passed that story on to you. Not uh, Glasgow Titus, of course, but who was, was it your, your most, your, your grandfather that, that shared the narrative that inspired you? And what did he say that inspired you to, to collect this history? Well, actually, it, yes, it was my grandfather, my mother's father. My mother is the Titus. Uh, she's the oldest uh, daughter of Ella and Thaddeus Titus. And I, I, was, I, was, I was more intrigued with the elders um, that were the elders when my grandfather was a little boy growing up. He always spoke of going back uh, into the country, they call it down in Maysville, South Carolina. He always spoke of going back and helping his aunt Josephine and Alice um, chop wood, um, you know, pick peas, uh, raise crops, or, you know, raise, raise crops or whatever. And it got to a point where I was more intrigued with the things that he would say and then the names that he would pass down to me and who those elders were. And even in, in grandpa's uh, in, in grandpa's state, I he gave me two names. One was Glasgow Titus and one was his grandma Hannah. And then I realized that Hannah would have been the second wife because I found that the first wife was Julia. And I said, okay. He gave me Hannah because Gra Grandma Julia would have passed away because he was the youngest, he was the second youngest of 11 children. So if Grandma Julia passed away early and Grandpa took a second wife, he would only know of one grandmother. So when I found Hannah, I also then eventually found Julia. But learning that the Titus men and the Titus family itself were a very even, even in the conditions of sharecroppers, okay? After slavery, in the condition of sharecroppers and them finding their way, the Titus family held themselves in a certain way in a certain esteem about them, about their business as family and about keeping their families close and connected. And in the journey, I learned that there were those families all across America that were almost identical in the things they did as far as keeping the family close. I mean, I can, I can just uh, uh, share with you briefly. We, when, I, when, we, when we first did a family reunion 
in Rochester um, before my grandpa passed away around 1994. And we created the shirt for the family and the name across the top of the shirt said, a family that prays together stays together. That was the first lettering on the shirt of our first huge reunion in 1994-95, if I'm not mistaken. A family that prays together stays together. And then fast forward, while I was out in California, and Deidre was there with me as well in California, um, last July, we were with the elder Titus that turned 100 years old. We just recently lost one whom I uh, was with on his 90th birthday out in Los Angeles, but we were out in California for uh, Cousin Willie's 100th birthday. Dallas, Dallas. Oh, Dallas, in Dallas, Dallas, for Cousin Willie's 100th birthday in Dallas. How can I forget that? And I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. But we, we, we had our celebration for him. And then when I went to visit him on his home that Sunday, I went to visit him on his home that Sunday and on the wall, he had all these pictures of the elders in the family and those that have come before and along with him at hundred years old. And the writing over the top of the wall of all those pictures was a family that prays together stays together. And this is the 1812 branch of the family and we're the 1845 branch of the family. And then I've seen the same language in an 1835 branch of the family. So what that tells me is that is the, the, the universal energy of a people and a family is there and the connection is there. And with what my grandfather gave me, when I went back to Maysville, South Carolina, to explain to those cousins in, in Maysville and Sumter, South Carolina, for the first time, that I've uncovered something different in who we are as a people and to share with them what has taken place and, gonna, and what's gonna change in our lives because of learning who we are. That's when I had the spiritual revelation that this is much bigger than myself. This is much bigger than myself. And the only thing that I asked uh, from those family members during that time period was your blessing to move forward to continue to learn who we are and where we come from. And again, this has been 16 plus years later. And thanks, thanks to grandpa for giving me the information. And I thank, uh, thank God for giving me the wherewithal and the knowledge and the information to be able to use what, what, what and, and to be able to use and understand, use and understand what I'm seeing, what I've seen, where we're going and what we're doing here now as a family, because the future of the family is what's important. All right, you know what, the time flies when you're having fun. So we got about know, 14, right? minutes, 14 <laughs> minutes remaining. And um, remember you can get your question in. Now, Deidre, I think you wanna go, but let me ask this question right quick. Uh, either Deidre Sage or uh, Solomon, can you tell us more? This is a question from uh, the audience about how Ismail Titus recorded his history. And uh, did you say that he was in court or did we hear that right? Yes, Ismail Titus recorded his history in, uh, in the Massachusetts Commonwealth Court of Law in 1832, October 10th, 1832, he told his story in the court of law. And- uh, An affidavid. Yes. An, an and, the reason, and the reason why he was giving an affidavit was because during that time, the United States was trying to raise an army. And when you've been in war, you're not really that interested in doing another one. So the incentive to get people to become conscripts was to offer a veteran's fee or a veteran's salary, a veteran's pension. And if you were a survivor of the Revolutionary War, you should go to your um, parish or to your, um, your recruiter, recruiter. Right, to, to, and, and, and file your affidavit to prove where you fought, who you fought under, what battles, um, to give specific information so that it could be verified. And that's how Ishmael's story 
became known to us and recorded in the Library of Congress. Of course, he left a, he left a trail of crumbs for us. He yes, left, sure did. He left a trail of crumbs. He didn't get any money. He never got a pension, but he left us a paper trail. And that's how we found him. Uh, there was another question I noticed in the in the chat that asked how we made the connection to uh, the Fulani people. And I want to say that we have um, been turning every stone and found a company called AfricanAncestry.com, who um, I think we did this about six, seven years ago, Solomon. Yeah. Um, AfricanAncestry.com is a company uh, that is run by uh, African-American ge ge geneticists and scientists who um, have traced uh, the lineage of 400 different ethnic groups in West Africa, South and West Africa, to identify where people in the diaspora originated. And they're able to take our genetic material from our uh, matrilineal line or our patrilineal line and trace us back to the ethnic group from which we come in Africa because they are unique and they are identifiable. They only deal with people whose bloodline comes from Africa. Um, you're not gonna find that stuff on the other uh, companies. And in this company, your information, your data is not shared or sold. So we confidently have been given the allele reports of our genetic um, heritage and its similarities and ab absolute similarities to the ethnic group known as the Fulani people who are in three or four different uh, West African countries because the borders have changed since those original times. But the Fulani uh, people are in uh, West Africa and in Ghana, in um, uh, some in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, some in uh, Mali, and I think the other group are in um, uh, Cameroon. Like Cameroon, in the Cameroons, that's right. And so that's how we found it. If you are interested to know what your African lineage is, I would suggest that you go to that group. I'm gonna put it in the chat. So thank you. And I just wanna say something about Joanna Foley um, because I have another friend on here, Eileen McFall. And I wanna talk about allyship because uh, Joanna Foley is actually um, a journalist and a writer. And she's one of the people who actually know that this is not black history because whenever we highlight or bring out the contributions of African-American people, it's always thought of as black history when actually it's American history. And I think Ishmael Titus is one of the figures that proves that. Yes. 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 Very good point, very good point. And I also put in the chat, the organization that we worked with last year, a couple of years ago, the African-American Historical and genealogical society, uh, they will come to your church or come to your gathering and uh, they can't do as deep a dive as the organization you're talking about, Deidre, who was featured on a national television show earlier this year. Oh yeah, they're um, large now. They've blown yeah. up over the past few years, yeah. But uh, that group, the AAHGS, they can do something. Um, and uh, they they traced our family back. They couldn't go back quite as deep, but um, yes, yeah, wonderful investment uh, for you to learn about your family. Um, I did have, I think Joanna put in some information and we're sitting on about, about eight more minutes, uh, but I wanted to talk about what Joanna mentioned. Uh, and let me tee up my intern, Joni McMasters to get a question ready. Come on, Aggie. I need you to chime in, get one question each webinar. Uh, but she talked about a place we could visit in Charlotte. And now, oh yeah. Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which is Mecklenburg County, they have the Liberty Walk, 1775 to 1783, which honors African-American revolutionary heroes. And uh, it does great mention of Ishmael Titus. So 
I'll actually be in Charlotte this weekend. So I'm going to try to get by there and check it out if I can get away from this conference. Uh, but go ahead. And so, Joni, you ready? I think so. I really have a comment more than a question because I read up on some of his information last night. And what I saw was that he was 89 when he went to potential for his pension. Then my question was, I read a little bit today at my break, and they said that he was not awarded his pension. So that was, you know, I was like, oh, man. Um, I just say the United States government, <laughs> whatever. Um, they owe a lot of people when I hear different things that have happened. And then I like the last comment that she was saying, you know, it's not just black history. And then what I'm learning is just American history because we're all there and we've always been there. We just haven't been recognized or given the due that we that our ancestors so deserve. And if, I guess if I did have a question, I know that they're saying that they pass it on other information orally. And then um, some of the people that I run into, they don't like to talk about Africa and that they came from Africa. So how do you, I guess, in a way, convince people, uh, you know, that it's something to be proud of? You know, our heritage and our history, because I see that a lot of times. People say, just let it go. You know, we don't need to know about that. You know, we don't want to talk about slavery anymore, you know. And, um, I, 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 think, I, I think all of us would probably be able to speak to that, but I do mm -hmm. want you to understand mm -hmm. is that only the gifts that are inherent in us as a people that came across the Atlantic mm -hmm. and that are has emerged despite the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade acknowledging that is a part of the healing. Mm. And I say that wholeheartedly because when you have a culture that exists by undermining or deleting the value of a whole group of people, there is a level of internalized oppression that we have yet to heal from and trauma has plagued us all, including the dominant culture, as mm -hmm. well as those who had violence perpetrated against them. Mm -hmm. So I say, I am Sage Chioma, African, born in New York City. Okay. <laughs> it's a campaign, actually. <laughs> Everybody doesn't know about it, but people from the diaspora, that's part of the healing to say, I, I, I am so and so, yes. an African born in Sumter, yes. born in Birmingham, born yeah. in Brazil, yeah. born in uh, what? Uh, Barbados, born in Jamaica. That is the campaign, is to get people back in their natural mind of knowing they belong to a group. Because menticide separates you to such a degree, you don't even know you belong to a group. And that individual of success and achievement and all of those things prevented us from, like I can honor that Solomon, he's constantly harping on the family, the family, the family, because that is a part of our tradition that is somehow when you assimilate, it gets watered down or lost. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, uh, looks like we're gonna have to do a, a series of webinars. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. I wanted to say. Um, now, I'm no historian, I, I, I'm a journalist, but I am pretty good at doing research. And I have found the names of at least 20 other African Americans who fought in the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. So if we find them and their descendants, think of how many wonderful webinars we could have going forward, just like the one today. Right. And we got we got two minutes left, so I, I can't, unfortunately, I can't get a long answer. So I'm going to pick on somebody to give me a response to represent the group. And um, and I'm going to ask Deidre, can I get you to do that? You, you're the, uh, uh, you're the one I can see close on my screen. No, you don't have to ask me if I want to talk. Go no, ahead, yeah. ask the question. It sounds like we got the same problem then. <laughs> <laughs> 
in a, in a, in 60 seconds, can you tell me what would it mean to see a monument depicting someone like Ishmael Titus or someone of the same like um, in Greensboro, in, in New Jersey, in New York, wherever? What would it mean for you? Uh, seeing that you're a descendant of someone that's acknowledged as uh, being a hero of the Revolution Revolutionary War? It would mean for me that our nation is on the route to healing. Um, we cannot ever solve a problem that we don't address. And if we are able to acknowledge the incredible the incredible contribution of everybody who lives in this country. Imagine how elevated our lives would be. Imagine, we have to overcome this, this thing where I will, I will sabotage myself to stop you from having it. I will, I will, I will make, I will be miserable just so that you won't be happy. We have to stop this. Thing. It has Great. to stop. And so it is this, a, a monument would mean that people finally have put it down, put the hatred down, put the anger down, put the egos down and let's us start to live together the way God intended for America to be, the, 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 the melting pot of the world, not the melting pot, but a place where the lion and the lamb can coexist. Beautifully said, and uh, we're gonna have to close it at that note. I would like to close out by saying the past three webinars I've done, and even the discussion I did last week over at, at your, uh, your spot where you hang out, Sage, at the International Center Civil Rights Museum. I used to think that the opposite of love was hate, and I no longer believe that. The opposite of love is apathy, the inability to think of others. And, uh, and you see what great greatness can come from that. And so I applaud Joanna Foley, who does not look like anyone on this, anyone's face that you see. Um, but it was her efforts that inspired us to come together and do this. And she was thinking of others and not herself, but thinking of the greater good. And when you operate with that sentiment and with that drive and purpose, beautiful things like this come from it. So uh, uh, a wonderful discussion. I uh, hope that some classrooms can take this and use it as a resource. And I would like to look forward to next week. Uh, but thank you to everyone here, the Titus family, Solomon Titus, Deidre Lavelle in New York. Solomon, you're in Brooklyn, as well no, as in uh, Rochester. He's in Rochester. Oh, Rochester. I'm sorry, Rochester. A little more. He's in Brooklyn, <laughs> and you're in Brooklyn. And Sage, you're right here with us in uh, Greensboro, and uh, my education staff and our volunteers here. Uh, and next week, uh, tune in for the final episode of this series, where we'll talk with John Dees, who wrote the book "They Were Soldiers: African Americans Serving in the Continental Army, 1775 to 1783," along with Trevor, Trevor Freeman who uh, did a thesis on this topic. He's with the Western North Carolina Historical Association. So that's next week, next Tuesday, beginning at 6 p.m. So for now, thank you to everyone.